Barnes & Noble Union Square. Please give a warm welcome to New York Times best-selling author B.E. Schwab and award-winning author to Anya Bucci. Oh my goodness, Tochi. Oh. I just can't get the grin off my face. Tochi is one of my favorite humans in this entire world and like the moment, like, like I'm glad you all are here but I'm just really excited to talk to Tochi for like an hour and a half and have a good excuse to do this. It, it's funny, as I was adjusting the microphone, I was like, oh, so this is what Lady Gaga was feeling like at the Oscars when she did that <laughs> duet with Bradley Cooper but like platonically. <laughs> I love it's like, it. It's that exact I love feeling. It. I love you so much. Um, I am so, so excited to be here. Um, I know you've already been told about the postcards, but just to like, just so you understand from my perspective why they exist, I know this is the first tour I'm doing where I'm not doing a live signing afterwards because there are so many of you that it wouldn't be possible. And so if there is something that you would have said to me in that signing line, uh, you can put it on the postcard and nobody else will read that. It's going to come to me directly. It will live with me. It gives you more time to think about what you might say. It gives me more time to process because it's really hard when you're trying to spell someone's name right and also look good for a picture and also like do a good job as an author to hear everything that you're saying so if you don't have anything to say that's totally fine just a little keepsake and if you do then know that it will just live with me in my house and probably be like eaten by my cat <laughs> <laughs> It's not the worst of fates. No, I mean, it's yeah. true. like, they're very cute. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they're no. They're very cute I've, cats. So. I've seen the photos. Yeah. I've seen the photos. Yeah. Uh, well, so, I guess, first of all, congratulations. Thank you. On the paperback release of yeah. Addie LaRue. It's been a little while in the making. <laughs> it's been a pandemic in the making. Well, like, so I was going to I was gonna ask about that. This book has had somewhat of a, I guess you could say, unconventional <laughs> life cycle so far. Yes. And... What has that what has that been like living with a book for as long as you've been living with Addie? I cuz I know, you know, you and I we both have a bit of a productivity Jones. We like to jump to the next yeah. project. And so what has it been like to to still have this book live so vividly in your professional life? I mean, it's very surreal. So you should know like for anyone who doesn't know, it took almost 10 years to write. And when you're writing a novel, you're not thinking about the context in which that novel is going to be published. You're just thinking, I'm going to write this book. So it's not like I was picking themes with a pandemic yeah. in mind. And it was supposed to be, you know, it was coming out in October 2020. It was supposed to be almost like a victory lap. It was my 20th published novel. And, Woo! <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and, it had not always been a really smooth ride, and so it felt like we were finally cresting, like all of this build up, all of the audience that had grown, like Addie was gonna be the celebration moment for it. Like I was being asked to headline festivals that had never blinked at me because I was a fantasy author and they didn't consider fantasy to be like on that level with fiction. Like I was getting into all these places where I was gonna be a defiant fantasy author. And then of course the pandemic started and you know, among so much big sadness, it feels weird to talk about small sadness, so know that. I'm acknowledging that before I talk about the small sadness, but for about six months, every day I'd wake up and something else had been canceled, and all of the things leading up to Addie were canceled. And I'll never forget that on release day, instead of being on a big international tour, I was standing in my parents' garden picking raspberries. Um, we were on lockdown in France. I went down the day before the borders closed, and I brought a carry-on suitcase, and I ended up staying for 16 months. <laughs> and uh, on that day, I was literally picking raspberries because in France, like, we couldn't travel more than a kilometer without written permission. So we were just village bound. And it was just raspberries to go in lunch. It was literally to just go in lunch that day. And, and instead of feeling sadness, instead of feeling like I had missed out on anything, all I could think in that moment was, Addie would love this. Yep. Like this moment of quiet joy and like Addie has been such a weird experience because I'm used to my books taking five to 10 years for them to like really reach their audience. I'm used to the patience game when it comes to the kind of following that I have. And I was braced for that. And then Addie comes out and because of the timing, because of whatever it is, because of the themes, it takes off because of book talk, because of a million things that I need to think. <laughs> because of y'all. <laughs> because of all of you, basically. <laughs> it takes off and it has this really strange journey and it was so diametrically opposed with the message that Addie was trying to teach me that whole way, mm. which is to like be okay with small joy. So it was like this very loud time and it was also this very lonely time. 
and it was the time of like incredible accomplishments, but at the same time, all I wanted to do by the end of it was just stand there and pick raspberries. Like, it's been something I've tried to hold with me as the world has, in a ways, opened back up, which is that like, it's okay to just, we have a very hard time slowing down. Yeah. Like, one of the reasons we first bonded like eight, nine years ago is like the hustle. Yeah. Like, we are relentless yeah. makers. And it is really hard as relentless makers to trust in anything but your own drive. Mm -hmm. And it has been an education in like, it's okay to take a beat and to just be mindful and be present and like savor the good and, and address the bad and just be there instead of always looking five years ahead. Yeah, oh, uh, like, preach. <laughs> <laughs> And so it's it's interesting because we were talking before the event about process and ways of trying to stay focused and grounded. And it's funny, one of the things that has also happened in recent months is that we both started newsletters. Yeah. <laughs> and so, a return to live journal. We're just yeah. like, can we just return to blogging? But like literally, it's like, <laughs> it's like how can I do live journal again, but not, not like taken over by the Russians. <laughs> yes, exactly. Our little analog way of writing letters into the void. And so I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about some of what prompted it, because I know there's an element of you know um, audience engagement, sure. but also, at least for me personally, one of the reasons I started it was that I was getting so caught up in writing for money or being asked to write things yeah. that I had lost that that place that I'd previously lived in where I was just like writing a thing because I felt it. And like, it, it was sort of like, sometimes it would feel like going to the gym on like Saturday mornings and just like shooting basketball yeah. by myself, like nobody else is watching, but it's like the most grounded and peaceful I feel like for the entire week. So like, what, what were some of the elements that prompted you to start uh, yeah. the newsletter that you started? And if you could give the title as well. Sure, uh, it's called The Visible Life of B.E. Schwab, which is so, <laughs> I know it's corny, but the worst part is that I'm so used to typing The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue that for like three months straight, I just called it The Visible Life of Addie LaRue because I would just <laughs> auto type. Um, I think it was in some ways a desire for analog. Like in a lot of ways mm -hmm. I treat it like a, I'm writing a letter. I know we call it like a newsletter and that should be obvious, but it's not. Like, I'm, it's a monologue, yeah. but I want it to feel specifically like this. Like, you are sitting at my kitchen table or on the edge of my sofa or by the fire and I have poured you a cup of tea. I want it to feel small. I, and again, I wanted as well for it to be, it's not monetized. Like, it's yeah. an absolutely free newsletter. And I understand that's a luxury even in and of itself, but it was important to me to be able to have some kind of a longer form engagement and also just a kind of constructed intimacy. Like I try really hard to be transparent online, but it's very hard not to feel pressure to like compartmentalize yourself into what's a good caption for this post. And I kind of just wanted to be able to unfold. Yeah. Like I really wanted to feel like a coffee on a Sunday morning where we're just, we're like catching up on life. Yeah. And like, I also think it's very important to remember that authors are people. It sounds very obvious, but we become, like, one of the reasons I go by V.E. Schwab now, and, like, I'm Victoria to my friends and family, is that, like, V.E. Schwab is the fictional version of me that lives in your head rent-free. Mm -hmm. I can't really control what you do with that version of me. Like, it's, it exists somewhere between us. Mm -hmm. And I kind of, I wanted that intimacy on my own terms. I wanted that familiarity, and I wanted a way to remind readers that there are other things happening in my life besides the books I'm writing, because often I would be asked, well, why is it taking you so long to do this? Or what else is going on? There's this idea that we wake up, all we have to do is write books, we go to sleep, and it starts oh, over. It's a dream. It is, it is a dream. <laughs> but one of the first things I did in my newsletter was like an hour-by-hour hour breakdown of my day and why, yeah. even though I'm a te technically a full-time writer, I have maybe two hours a day to write. And it's like, I just think... It's humanizing. Yeah. And I mean it in the way that like then readers can hold space for me when I'm struggling. They can understand when something takes a little bit extra time. I can share cat and dog photos yes. like ad nauseum. I just think it gives a sense of like friendship. And it's not an illusion. It's just, it's community on my terms. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to navigate the shifting mediums of social media and to like adapt and like the... Every single time, I love Instagram. This is the only place I exist, really. I, I gave up Twitter in like 2019, basically, yeah. it was the best 
best decision ever. Um, but even on Instagram, every single time I post, because of the size of my audience, I get nagged by the platform that I should be making a reel instead. Yeah. I've like had meetings yeah. with Meta, with the parent company, where they're like, you know what would really help us is if you could turn this into a reel. And I'm like, you know what I really, truly don't give a shit about is doing that. Like, <laughs> like I just, I just don't. But it's like we're pressured yeah. constantly to be adapting yep. to a media of social media, but we're also trying to adapt as creators and and it makes it feel like so often that that is the content we are creating instead of ancillary to the content we're creating. Yeah. Like, I need that energy. People will be like, well, why don't you use TikTok more? And I'm like, do you want books? Because <laughs> like, <laughs> I could happily spend eight hours a day trying to figure out how to do a transition on TikTok and have it look like I'm not 35 years old and that like I <laughs> aged into this normally. Or it could, I could write a scene of my novel. Yeah. And I care more about that. And so it's just a way to try and navigate like, the weird shifting expectations that social media puts on its creators and a reminder to readers that like, if my Instagram disappeared tomorrow, I would still be a mm -hmm. person and that you could find me there. Yeah, and it like, I think going back to the newsletter, um, it, it can be so liberating to like think in paragraphs. Yes, oh. yes. Just be, be oh. just lengthy, loquacious, like whatever you want to be, just use all the words. It's, it's like, it's like, it's like listening to a full rap verse as opposed to like. A clip. Yeah, as yeah. opposed to like a 280 character bar. Yeah. Right, like when you hear that, when you hear that verse, you hear the rhyming patterns and everything and they're just like dancing over the beat and then you hear the button at the end. Yeah. It's a more complete picture. Yeah. I think it's like an act of love from the author, from yeah. the creator, because it's basically saying, here, I want to give you more of me, but I'm getting to choose the pieces that I give. Like, I'm choosing them for you, mm -hmm. and it's not that it's curated so much as, like, I want you to have a yeah. complete picture, and this is how I feel comfortable yeah. doing that. Yeah, and, like, I, I think at the end of the day, too, a lot of it boils down to we just love writing. Yeah. <laughs> like... I love words. Yeah, like... I'm it, such a word nerd. We're, like, going to talk about craft a lot. I'm sorry in advance. because we're both such insane nerds for, yeah. like, how the actual act of telling story oh is done. Like, like, we were geeking out for, like, 30 minutes backstage, <laughs> and I was like, we should probably save some. But it was like, no, we're just going to, like, work on this. So it's, it's funny, because this isn't actually the first public conversation that you know, V and I have had about Addie LaRue, and I remember in our first event, one of the things that I was emphatic about asking you about was your kickers. Yeah. Because the way that she ends chapters in this book, <laughs> I was, yo, yo. <laughs> I was like, okay, what Faustian bargain did you make? <laughs> okay, like, it, a master class. And so you. like, and so with regards to, I guess the larger, uh, question of process, you know, as much as we both love writing, we're both very different writers yes. that love different parts of the process. And I think that speaks to how expansive something like process can be. So uh, I know you've, you're on record as saying you don't like the drafting process. No, I hate it. I hate everything <laughs> about it. It's like being dragged through imperfection. So like, so like, tell me about what what draws you to the writing of a book? Like, what are, the, what are those yeah. favorite sort of magical parts for you? So I'm an intense outliner, and whenever I say that, people think that I've just, like, intentionally stripped the joy. <laughs> They're like, but where do you find the joy if not in the act of wandering, meandering through a draft? But the joy for me is in the brainstorming. The yeah. joy is in the articulation of an idea into a skeletal shape. The reason I don't like a first draft is because an idea is perfect. Mm. When the idea lives only in your head, it is perfect perfect. It is flawless. The act of writing the idea down on paper is the act of making it imperfect. Mm. And then like, the way I think of it is like a glass orb filled with light, right? And that's the thing that's in your head. And then the act of writing a first draft is the act of smashing that glass orb, <laughs> like just chucking it into the distance, <laughs> watching it shatter. The light goes out. And the act of revision is the act of gathering the pieces back to you mm. and trying to reform the glass orb and hope that the light turns on. Uh, and so I don't like the first draft because it is an act of intentionally creating something less than what lived in your head. Mm. I can't make peace with that. I can't make peace with the gap between what I want a story to be and what it has to be in order for me to make it better. Like yeah. it just, it kills me. It absolutely kills me. And the way I mitigate that is by having a strict outline mm -hmm. um, and it keeps me from quitting. <laughs> 
That's just genuinely what the outline is. I like specifically must have my ending. Yeah. The ending is my like yep. load star. It's the thing that I'm writing toward and on good days I can't wait to reach it and on bad days I won't quit because it's a finite distance that I have to cross. But really the whole act of drafting, the act of drafting Addie LaRue was the most torturous nine months of my life <laughs> because I waited nine years yeah. to do it. And so the first five years was about trying to find the story mm -hmm. but the next four years was about being too afraid to make something imperfect. Mm. And it wasn't until I hit that like Henry Strauss crisis moment at like just around age 30 where I was like, oh, I, I get to choose right now if this book is never getting written. There's just a version of reality where this book, I would, had 19 other books to write. Like I was fine. Yeah. I had other things to do. It wasn't <laughs> like my whole career was waiting yeah. for this moment. Like I was a fantasy author. I had plenty of work um, that I loved, but I just had to decide, will I only have this perfect idea that lives in my head or will I create something that is necessarily imperfect? And I just, it took four years to like choose that crossword. Can I tell you what, what made the decision for me though? Please. Because yeah. I forgot. I like, I blocked it out. And then on the second stop of this tour, I remembered so vividly that it gave me just like extreme anxiety. It's a book called Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert. And there's a chapter in this book. It's a craft book. And in a chapter in this book, Elizabeth talks about having this idea. It's an idea for a book set in 1930s Panama, very specific about a woman who goes to Panama in the 30s. And for a year, she has this idea and she keeps putting it off. She defers the idea. She doesn't get around to writing it. One day she wakes up, no inspiration to write this idea anymore. It's like it has vacated the premises of her mind. Next week, Ann Patchett starts writing a book set in 1930s <laughs> Panama, almost the exact same situation. Wow. The anxiety attack yeah. <laughs> that this gave me. Like, oh, like Addie might just choose to like fuck off. Like Addie might just like, I might wake up on a Wednesday and Addie's decided to like go choose someone else. There's actually an Addie LaRue manuscript in my <laughs> Don't even dress joke. drawer right Don't now. Don't even joke. So I, I, this, I tried to keep this a secret for it's as so long mean. as possible, but... What a horrible... I mean, like, imagine being so dedicated to an idea and then it getting taken... Yeah. It taking itself away <laughs> because you couldn't be bothered to write it. I swear, like, the next week I started writing the book. <laughs> I was like, it's fine. But it was a torturous first draft because yeah. I was so loath to be imperfect. Yeah. I have since tried to make peace with the imperfection of a first draft. I don't like it, mm -hmm. but I like won't implode about it anymore. But the revision, mm. not the first round, the first round of revision is terrible. <laughs> you have to break the whole thing apart all over again. But like the brainstorming before you write and the final revision where you Ooh. finesse the syllabolic rhythm and the word choice and it becomes the, the words that you will all read in their final form, that is my favorite thing and I could skip everything in between. I don't like, I am somebody who enjoys having written. Mm. I rarely enjoy the act of writing. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's funny because I, I relate so much to that, that sort of paralysis that can happen when you build up an idea in your head yeah. for so long. Like for me, I, like I, I can't live with a thing for too long without it having been materialized yeah. because then I'm just like, there's no, like I'm not, I'm not going to be, by the time I'm finally free to write this thing, I'm still not going to be the good enough writer that, like that's sort of what happened with Goliath, yep. was for the longest time I'd been putting, I, I had a, a draft of it in 2015, and it was like a send outable draft, like it had gone to editors and stuff, it was good, but in the interim I'd read like a bunch of books that had completely blown up my conception of the novel, and I was like, oh, so there's all this other stuff that I could do, but there's no possible way that I can get Goliath to that level. There's no way. Yeah. Like, I'm not that good. And then over the years, I started yeah. getting better, writing more books. And then there was, even as I was writing it, there was no certainty that mm -hmm. I'd, like, pulled it off. It was like, because generally when I write, I, I have an idea of what I'm doing. Like, I generally know. Yeah. I have the structure and everything. It's all sort of figured out, right? But with Goliath, I was like, I don't know, man. That's a trust fall. I mean, it's a yeah. creative trust fall, and there's always a measure of it, especially because your taste must always exceed your ability oh, by the yeah. smallest amount. Like, you yeah. can't match them. Your, yeah. your ability will never exceed your taste level. Yeah. So the trick is the better you get at, at, like, writing and reading, the more you're just like, oh, I'm still not there. <laughs> like, you'll yeah. never be yeah. in that margin, and it's a very scary margin to exist in. It, it really, it's like every single time I think I'm tall enough to dunk, <laughs> It's not just that they raise the rim, it's that literally I raise the rim on myself. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, no, so that, so that's, oh, that's, this is all so fascinating. <laughs> it's, and it's funny because we've had this exact conversation about process, but it, it feels refreshing every single time because I personally, like, I delight in crafting sentences. Me too. Like, I just, oh. It's like sensual. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it is. It is. And it's sustaining. Yeah. Like, it's the thing. I can't really move on to the next chapter if I don't have at least some of those sentences that just thrill me yeah. to have on the page. Yeah. Oh, so, okay. So, so have you, have you had, or are there, are there moments during the writing process of Addie LaRue that stick out to you as one of those, like, wow, I just wrote a freaking bar. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I mean, yes and no. I like, I, I mean, I, I'm not normally narcissistic enough to feel it in the moment, but like usually in the revision mm -hmm. when I'm going through, but there are like, I kind of always know when something will be a Goodreads quote, if that makes sense. Like I always know when I've written yeah. something will be like, that'll be a highlighted moment. And in, in fact, if I go too long, too many chapters without feeling like I have one, I'll mm. start getting really stressed out. But like with Addie, it was weird because I, the very first line I ever wrote for the book is never pray to the gods that answer after dark. It was like the thesis. <laughs> so like I usually have a line like that, yep. you know, for Shades of Magic, it was all, you know, I'd rather die on an adventure than live standing still. Like I usually know when I have a moment, um, and then it's a little liberating because I'm like, oh great, I don't have to have any more of those. <laughs> but I mean, I'm always surprised to see you know, I remember you, obviously, and Never Pray the Gods That Answer After Dark are really specific. Mm -hmm. um, but the most important lines for me are ones that don't make it into the finished book. Like, mm -hmm. there's some way the scaffolding on which the book is made. For the longest time, every part in the book opened with the same sentence. And so the first line of the book was not a girl is running for her life. It was, this is how it starts. And then it wasn't a boy is born with a broken heart. It was, this is how it starts. And that was like a pre-line. But then through revision, it was like, okay, that scaffolding got me to this kind of oral storytelling atmosphere that I was going for. It's not actually needed in the final. And another example of that that I love is that Luke, uh, in the very early stages, for I mean, early stages being the first eight years, <laughs> um, whenever he came to visit Addie, he would greet her with a line of contemporary poetry. So poetry that was contemporary to the time period, but the very first line that he ever greeted her with was, come away with me and be my love. And that line, even though it ended up being stripped out because that was a really informative piece of his character that actually worked better as subtext, the cadence of that line, the fact that it's poetry, but it's a command, yeah. the fact that it has this kind of like rhythmic sensuality to it, that cadence was something I held on to for all of his dialogue. So I kind of imagined underneath all his dialogue, this like echo of come away with me and be my love and told in like menace and told in love and told in retribution like it just took on. So I am such, I, like my background's in poetry. So like the actual cadence, mm -hmm. I want it to feel like an act of hypnosis. Yeah. Like I'm like setting the spell. And then if I've said the spell right, it's activated for you. So that as you begin to read the rest of the scene, it's also, you know, those first lines and those, those last lines in chapters, they're tone setters, especially mm -hmm. when you have changes of point of view, um, changes of place. Like there are a way to kind of set your expectation as the reader for what kind of story we're entering. Victor Vale in Vicious talks in a completely different way and his scenes work in a much more staccato pace. Addie is, is an oral narrative. It's a story being told to someone else and then recounted. And so it has this layer of kind of circuities. The same sentences come back around the same way they would if you were telling a story to someone over many, many nights. I'm I'm so like I'm such a enraptured <laughs> that I like forgot my next question. I was like, please keep going. Yeah, I was gonna say I have, I have no idea, but I'm I'm that neurotic about um, scene beginnings and scene endings specifically. Mm -hmm. I used to only be. See, I'm getting so much worse. I used to only be this way with the first sentence in a book, and it would take me months, and I could not start a book without the first sentence. Now I've become such an ornery old old <laughs> hag that like I it has to be the first sentence of every chapter it has to do something for yeah. me it has to either have the right rhythm or the right vibe and then each end of the chapter also needs to take us out yep. because it, I feel like it's a cheat but when you're having a really good meal you remember the beginning and the end more mm -hmm. like these are the ways I'm like cheating the, your impressions up <laughs> like even if I have to have a lot of stuff half in a chapter even if there's a lot of information if I can like yeah. If I can bring it around like an elegant hem, oh, then yeah. I feel like you'll be with me. You'll be like, oh, yeah, 
the romanticism stays there. Because they like, them. and there's so many different like ways you could go about that, yeah. right? Like you could have a button to a chapter that's that like wraps a bow on whatever sort of thematic digressions yeah. you were going, you were expressing through the characters in that chapter, or you can have a button that is like a complete left turn. Yes, it's like it's like act three in parasite yes right? like, exactly oh like you're like what uh, yeah ex, ex, yo 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 yeah. you can undermine because what you're essentially doing in that moment i'm thinking about how i want the reader to feel at the very end mark and whether i need them to immediately turn the page yes every now and then as a reader i kind of like a chapter where i'm like okay i can go to bed now mm -hmm. like i get really annoyed when every <laughs> chapter is a cliffhanger because look sometimes we need to sit with feelings for a moment yeah. the henry chapters tend to end in a more of a place of like sitting with feelings. They're not so much cliffhangers as more like they're heavy. So maybe we need a beat, you know? And so I think I used to want every single chapter to be a cliffhanger ending, of course, because of page turnability. But now it's like, I sometimes just want to dictate or try and dictate the emotion that you feel and how that guides you into the next chapter. Because I'm the kind of reader that like finishes a chapter and then checks the beginning of the next chapter. So I kind of want to make you do that. Like, I want you to check, like, oh, are we going to go into something completely different? Are we going to get to another Luke chapter? Like, what's going to happen? Like, I'm that person who cheats forward by a page. It's funny because that, it makes me think of taking breaths. Yes. And, like, that's something that I'm so, it's just, like, always at the forefront of my mind when yes. I'm writing on, like, every level, right? So my comma placement, for instance, it's not like my third grade teacher would be like, what on <laughs> earth is going on but with you? But you're syncopating. Yeah. You're creating breath. Ex exactly. Yeah. Like, this is where if I were reading this out loud or if yeah. I were, you know, a reader just sort of saying it in my head, this was where I would take the breath. Mm -hmm. And that's also like how I think about chapter endings. And particularly when I'm reading as well, sometimes I need to take a breath. Cause yeah. like sometimes it's like, remember those, those, those episodes of like Game of Thrones or Mad Men where something ridiculously heavy happened yeah. and they didn't play the end credit music? Yes. It was just dead silent. Yeah. Like after Red Wedding, you're just like, are we just going to hang? Like, we're just going to hang on like the slowest version of the Lannister theme song, just yep. like one noting it out for us. Yeah, it's the movie. It's like when you see something or read something and then you sit there for a moment just yeah. like in silence. Yeah. Because you're like, I'm just going to just take a sec. Like, I'm just going to process that. I was that way. This is this movie. I don't know why this movie has such power over me. It's the last 10 seconds of this movie that had power over me. It's the end of Inception. Mm. It's the moment that, like, you're left wondering if the thing's going to tip. And, like, that moment, I yeah. sat there in the theater yeah. after it went black being like, wait, what? Like, I, like, yep. I like, had to sit with it, like, that we had that cutaway. And sometimes I... I like that. Also, we talk about the fact that, like, to get real nerdy. Yes. Breath is very important for you as the reader, especially for those of us who write a lot of action. Yes. There's this idea that, like, if you're going to write dark or you're going to write action, it has to, like, all be that. But my greatest trick, if you're ever reading one of my books and it gets funny... I'm trying to make you exhale right before I do something terrible. Like, I, yep. right before I murder a character, I will have a funny piece of dialogue happen because I want you to be like, ha and then you exhale. You're like, oh, yeah. great, now everything's great. And then it's just like, boom. Like, oh, yeah. No, murder. like, absolutely. We need that the ebbs in order to, like, lure you back into trust for the, the next rise. Like, it has to have a pacing. I, I see a lot of a lot of young writers when they're first starting out think that like once they take you up the roller coaster it just always has to go up but like the good roller coaster takes you back down yeah. and around and turns and has that variation of speed so you can catch your breath so that you're not prepared i don't want you to be prepared and if you maintain too high of a, an energy level for too long it's like a song without a yeah. course it's like a song without a bridge like it becomes tiresome in a way that doesn't work for your longevity as a reader. Yeah, so so, have you seen The Last of Us? Like, of course the I whole have. Thing? So like of that is totally yes. their thing. Every single every single time a happy thing happens no, in never that show, that. it's j you're just, like, oh, what a cute kid! He's drawing a superhero. Like get I bet the they're gonna be friends. Like no, <laughs> like I was like, oh, you're just trying to like twist the knife. Like yeah. I see it, I see it, and I fall for it every time. Every the moment that time. the two guys are tasting strawberries, I was like, can we just stay here. Yeah. Like, everything's okay, and we don't need to move on from this beautiful scene where these two men are sitting in a garden eating strawberries. I was like, I was like, Can we, we'll just pause it. Yeah, no, we'll I was like... pause it. I don't, nothing's gonna, it's a zombie show. Like, nothing good is gonna happen. Like, I, like I'm watching them bond over puns, nope, and I'm nope, like, mm -mm. 
Mm-mm. It's it's so loving and happy. Never and, trust it. And I'm just like, I don't damn trust you, it. Neil and Craig, for what exactly. you're about to do to me. Yeah. yeah. Exhale is a super important trick. Oh yeah. And uh, as mad as I get at them, it's totally like oh, the thing that I do. Played. Like I love doing it to my readers yep. all the time. It plays yeah. me every time. There's like a scene in in Conjuring of Light in like the Shades of Magic book where I introduce a character who gives like gives this beautiful little plant. He's like, I grew this plant for you and when we're back from our trip, I'm gonna become a priest and it's gonna be, you're like, you're not coming back. Like we, <laughs> you made a plant and that plant is going to outlive you and we all know it. Yeah. But it should still suck when it happens. Yeah. Like he's just a little, he just wanted to be a priest and grow his plants. Yep. Nope, yep. not for like... you. <laughs> not for you. My characters who I torture most tend to live. Yeah. And the characters to whom I give beautiful moments never make it to the end, yep. right? Like, yep. Because I think there's a line that Lila says in the very beginning where she asks Cal if he's ready to go through a particular door, and he says no, and she says, good, the ones who say they're ready always die first. And I feel like that's just my, mo- that's just my motto for everything I write. Like, oh, you think you're going to be fine? They're not. <laughs> you're not. That dude over there who just seems tortured by everything, he'll live. Yeah, he'll, <laughs> he'll live. They may not make it through in one piece. Exactly. But they're going to be live. tattered souls by the end of it, oh but that's God. where the fun is. Tattered souls are the best, though. Yeah, they're the best. They're the most satisfying. No, they, they, they like, like you really know in The Last of Us that, like, everyone they meet is dead. Oh, yeah. Like, because like, everyone they meet is having a lovely time in some way, <laughs> and they're just being, like, dragged through it, like, piece yep. by piece. Yep, no, it's, like, it's, it, I, I don't know, I just, I, I love that. So, and it's funny because even after every piece of media that I've consumed, every yeah. every book, every movie, every TV show where I've seen this happen. But don't get jaded. It gets me uh, every time. When it's done well, it's like you know you're in for the fall and you still trip. And I think that yeah. is like the best experience. And so much of what what we do, so much of what I do is in playing with that expectation. Yeah. Like I like playing in archetypes. I like playing in established narratives so that something about it feels familiar in a way that you can't place. And then it takes you by surprise because you're like, oh, I recognize this beat. To take it back to like the music part, I recognize this beat. I know it. And then it, sk- it skips somehow and you're not ready for it. And so it's about tricking you into the familiar so that I can be like, psych. Like, I mean, it's about just, it's a manipulation. Everything we do it's is all just manipulation. a large scale psychological manipulation. Yeah. Haven't you seen that meme that's like, have you ever thought about the fact that reading a book is staring at a piece of wood with ink on it having a mass hallucination? <laughs> and you're like, what? Power yeah. is that? No, hashtag shower thoughts. Exactly. Uh, exactly. You're just like power. I well, want it. It's funny because I was I was actually going to ask you about tropes and yeah. and like your relationship with tropes and established sort of narrative patterns and the idea of of freshness in that sort of familiarity and also too like how much fun can be had in those things. So much. Like I. I am an evangelist for the Fast and Furious movies. <laughs> and I know what's going to happen in every single yeah. one. Every single one. I can... In, even... Spe- I, to- I knew as soon as, like, six that they were going to space eventually. Yeah. I, like, trust me, real ones knew. Real, yeah. <laughs> real ones knew. But, like, it's funny because I'm, I'm there every single time. Like, yeah. I could... Pause a movie, and it's funny because if you're if you're like studying narrative, um, pro tip out there, uh, and you're trying to figure out like structure and yeah. stuff, and pacing and things of that sort, watch a Marvel or Pixar movie, and pause it at the 30 minute mark, and then pause it again halfway through, and then pause it again three quarters of the way through. In every single one, you will have arrived at the yep. same point in the main character's journey. Every single one. It's like clockwork. And yet, if you watch the first nine you. minutes up... It gets you. You're a puddle on the floor. Yeah. I've, I mean, when it, that's the thing. Like, people are always like, oh, how do I write an original story? I'm like, you don't. Yeah. Like, there are no original stories. What you bring to it is original perspective. Like, how can you play mm-hmm. with it? We're all playing with tropes. Whether you think you're playing with tropes or not, you are in conversation with every book that you have ever read. You are in conversation with the industry you are writing and you are in conversation with trend and the things going against those trends. Like all of it is informing you. You are in conversation with the things that you love and the things that you don't love. Like, and so it's about understanding these games so that you yeah. can play them. Cause we all want to get played in the exact same way yep. reading these books. We want to take that fall. We just want to be, 
we want it to be done convincingly. We want to be tricked into it, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. Because, like, is Jujutsu Kaisen Bleach the remix? Yeah. <laughs> I, but is it bad? I mean, is but that is a problem? It, but am I going to watch every single episode? Yes. Absolutely. Exactly. Exactly. We want, we want, there's something, there's a comfort in the familiarity. Yeah. There's a reason that when we find a space that we love, we return to it as readers over and over again. There's something that we crave. So the, the, it's about figuring out how to give you guys that thing that you crave while also it feeling fresh. And like, it, I want, like, as a reader, I'm so demanding now because mm -hmm. I'm like, surprise me. Do you know how hard it is to surprise me? But when it's done, I become evangelical. Yeah about those books. The ones I'm evangelical about right now is Margaret Owen's Little Thieves and Painted Devils. This is like everything I love in fantasy, so many archetypes and so many tropes, and it's just so beautifully turned from noon to one o'clock. Like it's just, mm -hmm. just off center enough that I feel like I, when I'm right about a turn, it doesn't feel like I knew that. It was like, yes. Yeah. And when I'm wrong about a turn, I'm like, mm, good job. Like, <laughs> like, and also yeah. as just a word nerd, the, the prose yeah. is like, Immaculate. Yeah. No. So. So. Are there. Are there any books that like sort of throughout your, not just your writing career, but sure. also your career as a reader that you feel sort of aspirational towards? I mean, I feel aspirational toward every good book that I read. I feel aspirational towards ones where I can't figure out how they pulled it off. Yeah. Like I get really aspirational towards like certain Gillian Flynn novels because I'm like, or is it Gillian Flynn or Gillian Flynn? Do we know? Gillian. 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 We're like, oh, I'm going to take Bruh. that with me now. Gillian. Yeah. Like, Gone Girl will make me always Bruh. feel a specific way where I'm like, how did you do it? Like, um, I feel different ways, like, for plot mm -hmm. as for writing. Like, there's just certain kind. Like, Neil Gaiman will always do it for me for prose because it's just a slight kind of whimsy that mm -hmm. I feel speaks to my childhood while yeah. also being extremely mature and adult. Um, honestly, every year I aspire to find, like, three to five books that I just just like rock my world. Like a good book makes you a slightly different person when you finish yes. reading it. And as a writer, I'm like picking it apart and I'm like, how did you, how did, like, how did this work? I'm like yeah. turning the, the sphere, trying to figure out where the light is in it. Yeah. So what about you? Oh my goodness. Like the, the one of the books that I keep coming back to, yeah. um, A Brief History of Seven Killings by yes. Marlon James. And um, it's, for those who don't know, it's, uh, it's set in, it's basically As I Lay Dying by William Faulkner, but instead of the center event being Addie Bundren's funeral, the center event is a 1976 assassination attempt on Bob Marley. Ooh. And it's written 85% in patois. How on earth, the audacity yes. of this I was book. Say, everyone in every, like, bachelor's degree creative writing program who has been taught never do anything in any form of dialect. It's just like... <gasps> it's literally like heart attack inducing. Yeah. But it's uh, like there is one scene in that book in particular where a character is being... Um, it's, it's a very intense book. Um, but a character is basically being buried alive and it's told in stream mm -hmm. of consciousness as they're being dragged up this hill by these Rastafarians and be like... And it's just like... I, like, I don't know what's happening to me. So I'm not a fast reader. This book's like 700 plus yeah, pages. Lengthy. I read that, John, in like four days. <laughs> it was like staring at the sun. Yeah. And like afterwards, I was constantly picking up. I was like, what is the structure of this thing? Like, mm -hmm. is this like a spiral narrative? Like, how does this get? And then I'm like, this chapter and da 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 da. And this, the, you know, this number of times this POV recurs. And da, it was like, you're, I was. You're such a nerd. I love it. Like, like it you drove like me mad. You me feel less nerdy about the fact that I'm like picking a book of art, being like, how many points of view are they? Did we switch to second person here? Like, who made that choice? Why are we doing that? Actually, that works. Like, it's that thing where you're just like, how? Yeah, and like, I Why? think one of the wonderful things that that reinforces is that um, when it comes to this writing stuff, there are no rules. No. There's just what works. The rule is do it well. Yeah. Do it well enough that it becomes undeniable. Exactly. Because like, then it becomes the example we use of like, the thing that made me eat my words about how stories work. Um, yeah, there have just been so many of those. I remember the first time I picked up You by Caroline Kepneys, and I was like, excuse me? <laughs> We're gonna tell this whole book this way? And yeah. like, it shouldn't have worked. And like three chapters in, I was like, I will follow this stalker serial killer yeah. forever. You're gonna make a sympathetic stalk. I mean, Penn Badgley makes it more sympathetic because it looks like Penn, Penn Badgley. <laughs> yeah. like, um, but I remember that way with the library at Mount Char, which is the book I'm like historically evangelical about because not enough people ever read it. And I'm still not sure if it's just like 
a great book or just so deeply weird that it yeah. lives in my mind at all times. But it's basically like about like children who were trained to run a library of all the knowledge in the universe, and it's about them as adults after the person who trained them was murdered. And like it's so bruh. Just I know I'm like how <laughs> whose brain whose brain like what books was he reading? Yeah. It's Scott Hawkins. And I'm like, what yeah. were you reading? Yeah. Like I want your reading list, please. Yeah, yeah. I love stuff like that. I love stuff <sighs> where I'm just like, if I think to myself, I don't think I like this category. And then I read a book that makes me just be like, oh no, I just hadn't found the right book for me yep. in that category. Love it. Oh my god. Absolutely love it. So <laughs> I like, I, as you can probably tell, I could like monopolize you for like yes. all night. But I think. This could go on to like midnight if it's just the two of us. Sorry. No, but like <laughs> at least, right? Um, but I am under the impression that there might be might some. Be questions? Questions okay. from the from the audience, and so and you have virtual ones as well. So every yes. now and then we might dip into a virtual one. There are roving mics, so all you have to do is raise your hand, and I'm going to make Tochi call on you so that I don't feel any pressure. <laughs> She's so see tattered souls. <laughs> yeah, tattered, tattered souls. souls. I've learned my lesson. Um, yes, in the second row. If you if you are able to and you want to. Um, well, so I have Addie's oh. constellation, and she like means the world to me, and your Thank writing you. means the world to me. But I'm wondering, like, what goes into writing a character with the depth that Addie has? Obviously, she's seen things. She's seen so much more than any of us will see in a lifetime because she's had so many lifetimes. What goes into writing that experience? So what goes into writing an experience of, like, an immortal over 300 years? Essentially, <laughs> <laughs> essentially I take a decade. Like, I basically stretch. So obviously I can't, I can't account for all of the nuances in that lifetime, but what I can account for are like the eras that we go through, right? And so I broke Addie's 300 years down into three acts for herself. There's like this act where she's driven from spite, this act where she's driven from loneliness, and this act where she's driven from hope. And I kind of grafted Luke's relationship with her onto that arc then. And their relationship is almost like the five stages of grief. Like they go through a very specific arc as well. So there's like a psychological um, grafting that I'm doing that mimics a, a, a thing that we all understand. I've just stretched it over many, many, many more years and I've picked the highlights and the lowlights. So it's not that I'm trying to account for every moment of Addie's life, though I did account for much more than I ended up being able to put in this book for the balance of the one year and the 300. But I'm looking for like, what are the crucial moments that one goes through? What is the most hopeless moment that Addie is going to have? What is the most hopeful moment? What are the close calls? And like, how does that graft onto the time period and the place that I've put her in? Like, I track her through an admittedly like very Eurocentric path, but it was done intentionally because if you have to remember that Addie never even wanted to leave France. Addie wanted time. Addie didn't want to be Carmen San Diego. Addie wanted to just like have a nice life and just have more time. And then because she's a woman traveling alone and she's not capable of dying, but she's very capable of suffering. And she's also someone who really loves art um, and beauty. I started grafting it along the European cities that were having like uh, enlightenments. And then I track that against what travel abilities would have been. And so that's kind of, I use all these components to build for her, not a universal path at all, but a hyper-specific one. And then onto that, I grafted where she and Luke were in their relationship in terms of how animosity was playing against attraction, against need, against want. Yeah. Uh, in the, the gentleman with the glasses and the yes. tatted forearm, <laughs> yes, welcome. <laughs> Hello. First of all, thank you for bisexual characters in your books and thank you. ac actual representation. Thank you. You're welcome. So you were talking about prose, and I'm really impressed by your metaphors and your similes. Like, thank you. You just dropped the best thing ever, like <laughs> a fundraising smile yeah. in the middle of a dialogue. I'm like, how do you do that? Is that just like... <laughs> Baggage or something that you actively it's, it's so much baggage worked. <laughs> it's so much baggage. Did you do something active to improve your metaphors and similes? There's some um, technique or study, or is just like your repertoire? Ooh. And if you if you want to add to that, yeah. Touch as well. I what I can I tell you what I love is that's a question I've never been asked before. Do you know how rare it is at this point in tour to have a new question? So thank you. Um, and I 
Love your tattoos. Um, yeah, so here's the thing. I, I, it's my brain, and I don't mean that in a good way. I mean that uh, you'll, if you ever hear me speak enough times, I use a lot of metaphor. I talk about a six-burner stove. I talk about a story as a house. I talk about these things. It's truly the only way I know how to make sense of the world. The world is so full of abstraction, and like I'm already asking you to participate in a hallucination while reading a novel that I find like a good metaphor becomes a grounding point for you as the reader. It helps you wrap your mind around something. Like when I'm talking about fantasy or magic, I use metaphor to remind you that like you have a foundation of understanding of what I'm saying. You don't need to think about magic as magic. You need to think about magic as a garden. You don't need to think about um, you know, any piece of the story in an abstracted way, I'm gonna try and ground you with metaphor because to me, it's not only a shorthand, it's truly how I move through the world and make sense of it. I am constantly using metaphor and simile in my own life to like self-analyze mm -hmm. my own like brain space, my own psyche. I truly don't know how to articulate what I'm going through. Like as someone with mental health issues, like the reason I gave Henry the storms like Henry thinks about mental illness, like about panic attacks and depression as a storm in that like it's terribly violent and all, but if you know that you can batten down the hatches and wait it out, the nature of a storm is that it passes. Things like that, like these are the ways that I know how to articulate to the people that I love things that are happening in my mind. I use metaphors in my very real life and then I just am constantly collecting them then for fiction, which is just, it's just how I know to story tell what's happening inside my mind to people who are not inside my mind. Yeah, no, it's, it, it's, the, it's a similar thing for me where it's, it's all about being able to articulate a thing. Yeah. And sometimes it's, for me, oftentimes it's a linkage between like the concrete and the abstract or sometimes the terrestrial and the celestial. Mm -hmm. And it's like, and sometimes it can go in, you know, from terrestrial to celestial. Sometimes it can go in the opposite where I'm describing this abstract thing and then as like the kicker to the paragraph, I'm like, you know, it's like X yeah. or I don't even say it's like, I'll just say X. Exactly. And like, that's another uh, quirk that I've discovered that I've been doing lately is instead of saying X is like X, I just get rid of the like or the as mm. and ooh, it punches yeah. things up. It really <laughs> does. Like y'all can't have that for free. <laughs> Like, if you just get rid of the, like, the mm. grammatical indication of the metaphor or the simile, ooh, oh. It's powerful. It really is. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to dip to one of the virtual questions. Sure. And this touches on some of your answer to the previous question. But from, from, Char from Charlotte Couchy, okay. um, and I'm going to paraphrase, did you, so what of your own sort of, personal feelings or I know what of the autobiographical yeah. is there in these in the characters of Addie LaRue and I know you know a lot of times if you get asked this question they're talking about like Addie or they're talking about yeah. Henry but what about Luke Ooh, okay um I mean, there's always a bit of me in the God character because I like, because not for that reason, not for that reason, um, but because we're like tiny gods. Like yeah. when you're writing a novel, like you are playing God. You are playing God to, I think it's like I grew up on Roller Coaster Tycoon. It's like that. Like I am <laughs> yeah. building a world and I'm populating. I never played Sims or that would probably be my example. But like I played Roller Coaster Tycoon and I made all the little characters throw up and then pass out on the roller coasters. Like I just like playing God. You had the half built roller coaster yes, so that the ride just shot I off into the I absolutely did. I absolutely did. Actually, no, I was way too obsessed with like winning and like the metrics and you would get docked so many points if like too many people died in the park. But um, I like playing God, and so uh, there tends to be like, whether it's um, like Oseron in the Shades of Magic series, or whether it's Victor Vale, or whether it's uh, like the master of the house in Gallant, or whether it's Luke, I like having a little bit of the author's hand be the like kind of God deity hand. Um, I just feel like that's always a little fun, but no, a lot of people ask me if like Addie is autobiographical, 100% not, Henry is autobiographical and not for a good reason. Like I, I had these three, it's a triptych, right? And eight years in, nine years in, I'm getting ready to write this book and I realize I understand Addy as a person. And I understand Luke as a God, um, mostly because I like wrote him as an old God with a lowercase g, which is just basically like, those gods didn't have to mature because they could be <laughs> fallible. So they're more representations of vice yeah. than they are of virtue. And he's just a petulant child slash toxic ex-boyfriend. Like I got him, <laughs> yeah. I got him. 
Henry was a cardboard cutout of plot. I understood exactly what his function was in the book, and I didn't understand at all who he was as a person or why I should care about him. And I was like, well, shit. Because if I don't understand or I don't care, you will never care. And so I made the terrible mistake of being like, okay, Henry, I will break off a very small piece of myself mm. and I will give it to you and I will grow from you a new person and I will then have a tether. And I did that and it wasn't enough. And then I was like, okay, okay. I was like the, the feed me plan in like, like Shop of Horrors. It was like, I just want more. And I was like, okay, Henry. And I just kept giving him small pieces until like, like little, see, I'm gonna use more metaphors, like shards of mirror so that I could see myself. And then one day I blinked and I accidentally had just made a mirror, <laughs> like head to see it. <laughs> so the way I describe Henry is that Henry is who I would have been if I had never found writing. Mm. Henry and my paths diverge at 19. I wrote him this way and it was not hard for me to follow Henry down a different road to who I would have been. It's not hard for me in this way that scares me to follow Henry into the dark in that way. Um, and so, yeah, Henry is me up to a point. I gave him all of my neuroses and I gave him none of my catharsis. I gave him none of my escape. And he's just who I would have been if I had kept spinning that wheel. Mm, tattered souls. Ugh. Oh. Bro, never doing that again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a fiction writer. Like, I was like, excuse you, sir. Would not recommend. No, would absolutely not recommend <laughs> ever putting that much of yourself in a person. To this day, he's the only character that I get a little bit... I would obviously like, never show it, Like, mm -hmm. but when people... If someone's like, I don't like Henry, I'm like, oh, no. that's fine. Oh, and then on the inside, I'm like... <laughs> Why would you say that about me? <laughs> and I have to remember that they're not talking about me, but like I it's the only character I've ever written that I'm actually protective of. Yeah. I yep. keep it I keep it on the inside, don't worry. Like I'm not but so it hurts. <laughs> what you got to do is you got to take that philosopher's stone and break it into a million pieces and then put it in all the I characters. I know. That's what I normally do. Yeah. I normally am like you have a little piece and you have yeah. a little piece and then I recognize just enough of myself. Yeah. I don't know why. I think Henry gave me so much trouble because I knew Abby and Luke so well and mm -hmm. I knew that he had to hold up his end of the tripod. And I yeah. was like, wow, you are not, you have to hold just as much weight as the other two. Yeah, no, I mean, so cheat code, make the character yourself. Yes, just make <laughs> yeah. it you. Make it you. Never, ever do that. No, like, it's, yeah, it's a no. terrible habit to get into. Yeah. Uh, so are the next there, question? Are there other questions? Ooh, okay. Uh, in the jean jacket, is that a denim jacket? Or a, it's, it's blue. It's blue. Yes. Um, my name is Yekaterina, and I'm from Russia originally. And firstly, I read your book in Russia. We have a really beautiful edition, by the oh, way. Oh, good. So um, I want to ask you a question. Like, do you believe that there is a world different from ours? Like, do you believe that someone from the outside can whisper stories to us to hint that they are real and want to be heard? Maybe Adi is something like a little demon who whisper in your ear. Yes. Do I believe it? I 100% believe in this. Like, you should know, like, I write the way that I do because I want the world to be stranger than it is, but because I also believe that the world is stranger than it is. My whole goal as an author is just to sow doubt in your reality. Like, I, mm. I, it's just all I want. I just want to yeah. crack that window open a little bit. But I think that one of the reasons I was so drawn to writing Addie is, like, despite the fact that I'm a consummate outliner, despite the fact that I feel like the small god of my world, ideas are ingredients that become a meal, right? The meal is this book. I told you, it's just going to be metaphors <laughs> galore. Metaphors for um, days. <laughs> but here's the thing. There is still a moment in that cooking process where it becomes a meal, and I can never account for it. I can never figure out who put the finger on the scale. Like I can never figure out what tips the balance. And I can't help but wonder, like, of there, it's very possible that somebody whispered a story in my ear and I forgot the person that whispered and I remembered a piece of the story. Like that is the thing about ideas. What, by the time you read a novel, it is so far removed from the ideas that the author had that first generated it. Mm -hmm. Like if I were to tell you all of the ingredients, first of all, I can't remember them all. But if I were to tell you all the ingredients that put it into the meal of Addie, you might remember three, but there's 20. 
There's so many little things and they change and they shape themselves over the course of writing and then they fall away. Yeah. And so I can't help but think that there is a piece of this process that I cannot articulate or account for. And some people call that inspiration, but inspiration is exactly what Addy is and what Addy trades. And so whatever, whether you call it a higher power, whether you call it a lower power, whether you call it inspiration <laughs> or whether you just call it creativity, the fact is there is an an unquantifiable aspect to creating story that we are not 100% in control of. Absolutely. Yeah. I was about ready for you to be like, I know exactly what happens all the time and there is no, no, you know this though, there's like a thing. Yeah. No, there, it's like totally, like those, so. It's creepy. Like the happiest and like most fulfilling moments for me in the life cycle of a book, it's, it's actually not when it hits the shelves and it's not if it gets celebrated or anything. There's like a thing that will happen while I'm writing, where I just, my body disappears. Yes. Like I just, I like me as a singular conscious entity don't exist anymore and I just become this vessel where I feel like I've touched, I literally have touched something greater than myself and it's all, whatever Empyrean energies or whatever are just like flowing through me. I wake up out of the dream and all of a sudden there's a bunch of stuff on my screen that wasn't there before. Yeah. And like that's not, like, no, like, you can't like yeah. you can't explain like no. how do you explain? It's 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 nuts. Like it's weird in a way that like in any other profession would probably not be acceptable. Like you would probably be like, I'm worried, but like we're yeah. just like, no, it's fine. I disassociated for like a solid hour and a half, and I came back to myself, and this work is done. I don't know how that happened. I don't know how <laughs> the semiconductor chip put itself together. Yeah. I just kind of blacked out. From it's a fugue state. Hours. So I read this book yeah. called Stolen Focus by Johan Hari, and he talks about the necessity of the fugue state for artists, mm. and it's not boredom so much as it's like the thing that happens in between attention and boredom, Ooh. and this fugue state is something that we're losing because of the constant accessibility of media, because of the fact that like we've all become two screen people. Like we have mm -hmm. something on the television or something on our laptop and something in our hand. There's no opportunity for the fugue state in which creativity happens. Yeah. Um, and anyway, I think about this a lot, but yeah, that fugue state, that beautiful place is the place where Addie lives. It's the reason mm -hmm. that there's a musician in the book who is like putting together a piece of music one day yeah. at a time. And he keeps waking up thinking that like, he's putting this piece of music together because he remembers the notes that she has played as kind of like a, the aftermath of a dream. Yeah. But of course it's Addie. Yeah. It like, it's, it's that. In, so like one of the things for me is that literally every, every time that my head's ready to hit the pillow, yeah. I'm about to fall asleep. I figure out, I figure out how to fill a plot hole. Every yeah. single time, like it's literally, uh, and I'm trying to be so much better about sleep hygiene. I put my phone <laughs> in another have, room. Never, every single time, we live in separate countries, and every single time I message you, you are awake. <laughs> like it is so upsetting. It's immediately like scene, and then you're like, ah, ha, ha, and I'm like, it is four in the morning, Tochi. <laughs> like, why are you up right now? Guilty. Yeah. But it's it's like that, or like in the show, like I'll it'll. It'll yeah. just happen. And there's no, there's no like thing that I did. There's no routine or mm -hmm. whatever. It's literally just, I'm in a really inconvenient place yes. right now. It's fallow ground. Yeah. Like you needed a patch of ground that was not already being tended. Yeah. yeah. So like, okay, so taking a little bit of a left turn, one of the questions yeah. that we got uh, online from April Enslin. All right. So <laughs> can you share any updates for the film adaptation oh, God. of Addie LaRue. Um, I know that my director is watching this, so I'm trying to be real good about this. Um, here's what I can say is like, I have been involved in adaptation work for quite a while. Like mm -hmm. I've had a TV show, I've had things that have gone and things that haven't gone. And I understand like, I wanna preface everything I'm about to say with, I am a popcorn optimist, and what that means is the moment I can go into a theater, spend an inordinate amount of money yeah. on a bucket of popcorn, yeah. and watch a movie, that movie is real. <laughs> Until that moment, yes. you cannot convince me that movie is getting made. Yes. Like, I sat at the premiere for First Kill, and I was like, I don't know if this is gonna happen. And like, literally, my <laughs> agent was like, it's on a screen. Like, yeah. I don't know what more you need. So I'm, a, I'm like a very big, mm -hmm. cautiously, I wouldn't even say cautiously optimistic. I'm a very big skeptic. Here's what I can say. It takes a lot of doors. It takes a lot of steps. Addie is in such good hands. Mm. My writer and director, my, my director is more protective than I am. 
about the story. Like, my director is watching this because she's like, I want to hear what readers say in Q&As wow. on your tour to understand what's important to them to make sure it's not lost. We have had extensive conversations about queerness and the fact that there is so much queer nuance in the novel that could easily get lost in the translation to a film. That will not happen. Though the ultimatum that I gave um, my team when we first started on this development was you can make it gayer. <laughs> like, you can't... I was like you cannot make it straighter. I, they were like, what is something that the readers will not allow? I said, you can't make it straighter. Like, yeah. no world, no yeah. world. So that has been a big MO. I think the most important thing to, want to remember, though, because I think there's, like, a pretty good chance this... I don't know. I think there's a decent... I think there's a good chance that this movie will happen. Um, I've read both versions of the script now that exist, and the first version of the script read like a love letter, and the second version of the script read like something entirely unto itself in addition to that. Mm. And that's the mark to me of a promising adaptation. Because if you were to hand a novel to someone and say, adapt this with the utmost faith to the source material, you would have a terrible yeah. movie. What makes a good movie, what makes a good mo book, they're in conversation, but they're not identical. I look at my two favorite examples, which is The Princess Bride and Howl's Moving Castle. These are not the same things. Like The book and the film are so not identical, but they are both so in spirit and in heart, and that's what I want. So it is about making the best movie, and people are always like, I hope they don't ruin the book, and to which I say, they're not gonna burn it. Like, <laughs> yeah. they, I Still mean, not in here. this state, yeah. but like, they're not gonna burn it. Like, yeah. it's, it's truly important to remember that the book will not cease to exist if and when there is an adaptation. It will be in addition to the book, and that to me is so exciting to have something brought to life, but again, when I sit in a theater with it, I will be, yeah. I will be able to say, yeah, my movie's happening. <laughs> I'm so skeptical. I, yo. I'm so, I've been in this too long. Fam, been, like, oh. Like, the, the first person to ever option one of my books was Ridley Scott's company for Vicious, which obviously did not happen. So, like, I am just, like, constantly jaded yeah. crone on the inside. But we have a very good team that is working yeah. so hard to do right by these three people. Oh, that's amazing. Well, you know, inshallah. Yeah, you know. thank you. Um, yes, uh, in the yellow. Hi. Hi. In terms of taking the book to the movie and casting, yes. we read it in our book club. And yes. There's this big, will you have two actors playing Luke and Henry or one actor playing Luke and Henry? Like, Oh, look at that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> ooh, I, there will be three. I think that it's important. Well, one, it's important because while Luke and Henry bear some resemblance, they aren't the same person. And I would never want that conflation. Also, in my opinion, it's deeply important that the chemistry is as strong between Luke and Henry as it is between Henry and Addie and Luke and Addie. Mm. Because there's a level of intoxication that's happening. There's a level of seduction that's happening from Luke toward Henry as well. He's He's courting Henry for a different purpose, but Henry is attracted to Luke. Henry is attracted, whether you want that to be on a physical level or simply on an existential level, I need to buy chemistry between Henry. Like, I think it will be cast in conversation, meaning this is a triptych. These are, you know, three components, mm -hmm. and I don't think you can cast one and then cast the next and cast the next. They will be cast in chemistry. And I think that's exciting, too, because you ever see something that you never would have picked an actor for, and yet they just blow your oh, mind? Like, yeah. I don't ever want to yeah. close doors yeah. on what could be an incredible triangle of, of yeah. character development. But I cannot imagine a world in which we do a disservice to the actors by making yeah. one actor and create, and then in some way, a strange mirroring effect where we start mistaking Henry for Luke. Yeah. They're yeah. so different personality wise. Oh my goodness. Yeah. But that's that's a really It's a interesting great question, question though. Like yeah. it's an absolutely great question. Um so an, another question actually, and this this was one that I that I actually had wanted to ask for some time. Okay. Um this is from Christina Carroll. Okay. And now as a fellow Francophile, yes. uh why did you choose France as Addie's birthplace? I love this question. It was, it's not obvious for me. Like, I live in Scotland. My family's <laughs> English. It, it could have easily made her Scottish. Um, my family's been traveling to France. My parents live in France now and have for the last almost 10 years. And um, 
But before that, my family would travel to France every summer. My father is type 1 diabetic. I swear this is relevant. He's type 1 diabetic, has been since he was seven years old. And when he was young, he was told, you'll never see adulthood. And when he was an adult, they said, you'd never see 35. And he was 35, they said, you'll never live to retirement. My father, in his early 30s, he's still with us, and he's in better shape than I am, and he has a higher score on Peloton. And I'm like, are you serious? Um, <laughs> my father, in his 30s, got to live in France for two years and work there. And ever since then, he held this image in his mind of, like, one day, if he lived to retirement, he would move to France. And so, growing up, every summer, we would go to France to almost, like, scout for the place where he would eventually get to live, always knowing that he might not make it. This was a dream for him. And so when he finally retired, um, my mom, who did not speak a word of French, knew how important this was to him, that she upended her life and moved the two of them to France, to a, to a village that is directly next to where I base Addie. Addie's village is fictional, but it's an amalgamation of a, two or three villages that are right next door. And so I know this region very well. But also... There are some positive stereotypes that are so beautiful and exist for a reason, and the French respect for culture, for food, for living in the moment, for being present, for never, like before the pandemic, there were no to-go containers in a restaurant, no to-go cups. You don't ever take food to go, you sit. Mm -hmm. It's community, it's enjoyment. It is a culture that works to live and not the other way around. It is a culture that appreciates beauty, and it's a hedonistic <laughs> culture, yeah. but it's so beautiful. And so when I knew that my main character was going to be a romantic, yeah. going to be someone that dreamed of love and dreamed of beauty and dreamed of art and dreamed a better, bigger, more romantic life for herself mm -hmm. outside of a provincial village that in many ways needed to be kind of juxtaposed between the old world and the new, the old gods and the new, setting her in the Sarth was perfect. It was just everything that I wanted it to be. Like I live in Scotland, which is still in many ways a very pagan place. But this period of time in France was a period of time in which the church was reigning. The church was this beautiful filigree thing. Mm -hmm. And Estelle is the last bastion of the old gods in this kind of provincial environment. And so I needed to put her at a specific place in time, but also a specific point in time in a specific place that would have led her to that seam between the old gods and the new, between the past and the future, and also give her the romanticism of character and of spirit that I had spent my whole youth and adulthood wow. learning and respecting. And so to me, Addie is written in so many ways as a love letter. The thing is also like, oh my God, I know this is a virtual event, so like someone else see something. Like Paris is full of assholes. And I feel like a lot of Americans, they go to Paris and they have a really terrible time and they develop a really bad impression of the French yeah. because of it. And what you have to understand is like Parisians resent other Parisians who don't live in their arrondissement, who don't yeah. live in their neighborhood. So as an American, like you don't have a fighting chance. But what started <laughs> happening around 17, 18 is when my family would go to France, we would never go to Paris. We would go to the villages. Mm -hmm. We would go to the countryside. And it was the warmest, most beautiful. I mean, again, it's the picking raspberries in the sun moment for me. Like it's just intimate. It's kind. We would sit in a garden having dinner with someone, with families that were just taking us in uh, at like two in the morning because the stars were out and who could end a meal when the stars were out? Like it's just a level of beauty. So Addie is a love letter mm. to what I think is like the best of mindfulness and presence and art and love. <sighs> I mean like what do you, yeah. even, where do you even go after that? Like I don't even, yeah, I, can't, an... I can't say like <laughs> that's a button. Yeah, um, it's a button. <laughs> um, any, are there are any there other any questions? Other oh yeah, we still have more questions. I love making you pick. Yes, uh, I'm always. I'm too. I never. I hate. I hate you. So mean. I, it's your job as the moderators. You have to pick. Um, I don't have to pick. Uh, towards the uh, yes, with the purple bracelet. <laughs> Purple bracelet. Yes. <laughs> yes well, you. We're getting specific yeah, now. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh, sorry. Hi. Um, so you were actually the very first book event that I've ever been to um, in my life, back for Vengeful at the Strand. So this is very exciting. This is very exciting. Welcome um, back. And I am a book artist. So one of my biggest fears is just completely misinterpreting a character. So I'm always curious, um, as an author, uh, both of you, like when you're writing, do you have a really specific 
view of a character in your head and how is it to see when or if um, fan artists or whoever take those characters and put visual representations? Like, what is that like? And is it ever, like, does it ever change your view of them or, yeah. I love that question. Mm. If I've done it right, most of the fan art captures them similarly, which is really interesting to me. So I, you might notice I lean into fashion a lot in my books. Um, like I use, I use Kel's coat or Lila's mask or Rai's like black and gold and red attire. And in Addy, there's the leather jacket. I'm like, I have a really hard time with faces. Like it's not, it's not all the way to like a face blindness, but like I will have met you like five or six times. I can't do it. My brain does not hold faces very well. And so I don't really think of my characters with faces. I think of them and I need some way to give you a visual shorthand. And so I'll pick like the angles of them, but almost it's like cut paper. Like I just don't have details very well for faces. And so I never imagine this part, but I imagine this part and everything <laughs> below and so I do my best, and I feel like I've done a good job, like I say, if like, like Kel always looks like Kel. It's interesting to me that Addie has a little bit more flexion, but it feels appropriate that the art of Addie is not all one thing because Addie is only open to interpretation, and so I like that for her. But it's something I really struggle with because I just don't think of, I'm not good at features. It's not something that I, I like works well for me as a reader. When I'm reading books, I don't have faces for the characters. I have like outlines and attire. So I use it as a visual shorthand to bring my readers really quickly back. Yeah. No, it's I, for for me. Oftentimes, what'll what'll be in my head about a character will be sort of the important parts, quote unquote. So. Uh, you know, their skin color or if a character has a metal arm, for instance, like yeah. that seems like a pretty important. <laughs> it's important. Bit. I mean. <laughs> um, sometimes hair, particularly yeah. if it's a story in which hair is like in, in Goliath, there's a scene where one of the main characters is getting his hair braided by um, the character who will become his paramour and it, with inevitably tragic results, of course. <laughs> and like that hair scene was so important to me. And so I, whenever I picture that character, I picture their hair. But outside of that, that yeah. I will only, if I try to think of a character, I will only see them like in a specific scene posture. Yes. So I'll see them like at night in bed with their partner as the moonlight's coming through, hitting the slope of their back and like yeah. everything is cast in blue. And like that's, that's where I see, that's where and how I see that character. Or I'll see them like standing on the lip of a cockpit of a mech over this like enemy encampment that they've just devastated. Like I'll see them silhouetted by the sun and uh, like I, I'll see that. It's yeah. really weird. It's like very, very, we very come, specific. We both come from the anime school of world building. And Don't I feel like what you're just start. doing right oh. now is yeah. like, we're just basically like, oh, we just see them as anime still frames. There's like opening credit. It's just, it's body language, right? Like I, that's the thing. Yeah. I can't think of what their face looks like, but I know exactly how Lila Bard stands. I know yes. how exactly how Luke enters a room. I know how they move through space yes. and how they look in certain light. And I know how they sound. Yes. I know their voice. Yeah. But if you ask me like where the exact angle of their cheekbone was, like I, I couldn't yeah. tell you. I, well, I think part of it too, it comes from when I was younger, having read so much fantasy where everybody had high cheekbones. <laughs> everybody had high cheekbones oh, yeah. and was olive skinned, whatever yeah. that means. Like yeah. every single character in every single book. And so it's just like white noise to me yeah. now. <laughs> Like literal. You're like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Noise. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> high cheekbones, sure, whatever that yeah. means. And then I saw high, high cheekbones in real life and I was like, oh, <laughs> that's what that means. Um, so thank you for your question. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yes, in the green with the <laughs> awesome half sleeve tattoo me. and the glasses. Yay, tattoo company. Show I know, up. right? Thank you both so much for sharing so much insight into your work. And I was curious, especially, um, I've heard you talk a lot about how like your characters stay with you and stay with you over time. And I'm curious for, for both of you, when you write, when you finish a series, or especially like Addie LaRue is a, a one-off book, like where is Addie now? Is she <laughs> still with you? Like do your characters stay with you? And, and sort of like what happens to them for you when they're sort of out in the world? What happens when it's over? Oh my goodness! You go first. Oh, my answer is really sad. 
Well, <clears throat> excuse me. It's I mean, when I when I bequeath them to the readers, it's sort of like it's sort of like they've grown into adulthood and they've just they're living their own lives now and whatever relationships that they form in their lives with other people is like their business and like I'm just like I'm just the proud parent or whatever that's like oh look at you living a full life and engaging with others and I've already <laughs> moved on to starting another family <laughs> so, <laughs> It's just easier emotionally to move on to the new family if I've just like completely, you know, left the old one to their own devices. Oh my God. <laughs> um, that's such a great answer. Um, mine's so depressing. <laughs> um, it, it depends, like, it's so weird because I never imagine, like, I choose a very specific point at which to end my books. Uh, it's sometimes contentious. But the nice thing is, like, I, I write my endings first, and then I rewind the entire narrative to find my beginning. So 23 books in, I have never changed an ending. The ending is the point. Mm. And an ending is not an ending. An ending is the point at which you have to leave the party. Yeah. Like, you cannot stay. They do not cease to exist. I need you to believe that they continue down their journey, but you don't get to follow them. Um, and so... Sometimes it's great, like for Shades of Magic and Threads of Power. Like, I left this world and these people that I considered family, and then I got to come home. And like seven years had passed, and there's like new people, but there's also people I left seven years ago, and I got to like start glimpsing almost like Polaroids of what they had been up to mm. in the years I was away. That's exciting. Addie is sad. Because um, this was a person who was in my life for a decade that I held and like was the passenger in the seat of my car, was my friend. I like everywhere I went, I asked myself, what would Addie see here? How would Addie move through this? What would she notice? And then after 10 years, she was gone. And I had to move on. I had to get a new family. <laughs> um, <laughs> but like there was probably a six month period after. Yeah. Addie stopped being mine and became yours, that like I just grieved. Mm. I never felt that kind of loss for anything I have made. Usually I'm ready to put something to bed and I was very ready. I needed, I, I wanted to end the story where I ended it. I needed to end it that way, but like, God, I, it's not that I missed writing the book. I just missed having an excuse to have conversations with this person in my mm. head. And that was hard. Like it took it probably six months of trying to come up with something to plant in the like six foot plot that that left behind because it did feel like grief. And like only just in the last like six months have I found like what I hope will be my next like the spiritual successor to Addie LaRue, my next standalone. Um, and it was like growing underneath her. Mm. It's the weirdest experience where like I looked down into this plot where I thought I was going to have to plant something and something was already growing up. And it's like I planted this next book like 10, like before I found Addie's story. So I would have been like a teenager. And I'm like, where did you come? Like again, to the inspiration of it, like where did you come from? So like I finally am starting to feel like I'm moving toward a new family because even when I was working on threads, there was part of me that was just like, I miss mm -hmm. my friend because I got to go home to Shades of Magic and I didn't get to go home to Addie. And I'm just starting to feel like maybe I've ma I'm making something that can sit next to Addie and keep her company. Mm. But it's like we were talking about this before. It's early days. Yeah. Like I'm in the I'm in the yeah. first draft of it. So like who knows? I could still ruin everything. So like we'll see. <laughs> Check back in a year. Yeah. But. No. That that snow globe still has a Ex way gotta, to go yeah. till it hits the wall. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, well, uh, it's your answer is so wonderful because it anticipated my question, which is kind of mercenary, and I think <laughs> it's on the you know it's on the minds of quite a few people. Yeah. Um, you know, which was whether or not you ever see yourself as whether or not you ever see yourself returning to this world, this story, this, like, is there, I guess in, in, in no, very there's no sort of, sequel. There's, there's no, no sequel. sequel. Okay. <laughs> it is okay. a standalone novel, and the beauty of a standalone novel is that, like, you should be left wanting more, mm -hmm. but not feeling like you needed more to understand what you've read. Yeah. Um, the only crack in that, it's not Addie related, is that, like, Luke 
is, an, is a god with a lowercase g, as I said. And that means that he's part of a pantheon. Mm -hmm. So the only place where I, like, I'm starting to, like, play, but again, mm -hmm. play in a way that, like, check back in 10 years, is, like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? it takes so long sometimes, is, yeah. like, what the rest of the pantheon looks mm. like, and I would love an intersection. I will, I want to say something, but, like, half my publisher is here, so I won't say something, which is, actually, I'm going to say it anyway. There is, um, in my next, like, standalone novel, which I can't share the title of, but is basically, I'm just calling it Toxic Lesbian Vampires, because it's about three toxic <laughs> lesbian vampires, <laughs> because I was, like, I really want to write a vamp, I really want to write a lesbian villain and I was like how am I going to do this I'll just make them all lesbians like because that way <laughs> yeah. it won't be reductive but uh there's a cameo because it's another historical where like it's about three women throughout history and one of them's like 500 years old and one of them's 200 years old and one of them's 20 uh one of them if I do it right will cross paths with Addie for a single scene in New York City so there's a I know, I know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So, <laughs> be like... on the lookout for the Addie LaRue extended cinematic myself. universe. I can't, I can't help myself. But... Is the headline here. <laughs> I love getting, in... I've not managed to make it through a single tour stuff without getting in trouble in some way. I just can't be stopped. This is why they should never let me keep secrets ever. But, um, in general, like, I feel very, mm -hmm. very, very secure that, like, this is a standalone novel, yeah. as contentious as that is. No, I mean I'm I I I like it. I like ending. I mean I we like both endings. like endings. Yeah, it's the part where you like, you either nail it or you don't. Like exactly. it's gymnastics, right? Like yeah. I don't like a half step. Like I want to nail it. Exactly, because like you know is. Is it a song if it doesn't yeah. end? So like an entire row of my publisher is now like very mad. <laughs> like like there's just like a muttering that's happening at row three here. That's just like, are you serious right now? Out like, of the corner of my eye, I'm seeing <laughs> furious texting. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine. Everyone just ignore row three. Um, do we have time for a couple more questions? We have time for I one more question. One more one, question. Oh, oh my, see, this is oh where gosh, you gotta be I'm mean so now. I'm so mad at you right I know. now. You gotta be mean now. Um, um, Wait, I want to pick. Oh, I yes, haven't gotten to yes, pick you picked the last one. Okay, wait, can we do two if they're super fast? Because I can't choose between two people that I feel like are very... Super fast, very Okay, good. in the black shirt, yes, your arm is being raised by your friend, it looks like. And then in the light blue, you'll be last. Hi. Hi. Um, my friend did want me to tell you that she loves all of your books. Oh, thank you. And she's really sad she can't be here. Aw. But I did want to know... So it jumps back and forth, and like the times, did you write it like that way, or did you write it chronologically and then split it all up? I wrote it entirely chronologically. So I, so actually that's a cheat. I, um, I planned all 300, it's basically about 300 scenes, and I planned every single scene. And then every day, basically just imagine them tacked to my wall, and then every day I would pick one scene to write. So I wrote the entire book out of order, but I planned the entire book in its chronological section. So I planned the entire 300 years for Addie and the entire year for Addie and Henry. And then because it was a character novel and I couldn't, like, there were just, like, I could not write the worst night of Henry's life most days. That was something I had to be in a very specific place for. I would wake up and be like, what am I going to do today? Am I going to write the French Revolution? Am I going to write a sex scene in New Orleans? Or am I going to write, like, some... So I would pick that way, but I planned them entirely chronologically and then had to braid all mm. the narratives together, which is a thing I do to myself sometimes when I hate myself, where I'm just like, and now make it pretty. Like, because, and also thematically, yeah. what's happening over the 300 years in the past has to thematically intersect that moment at the present every single time My so that we have a thematic goodness. echo. Ugh. Why do I do It's all intentional. It's like, so that's, intentional. That's why she's so genius. <laughs> like, and I'm just a neurotic mess. Okay. The last question, because I cheated, is the light blue. Put your hand back up if, yeah, in the, with the mask. And the, yeah. No, it's, okay. Two, three from, you, yes, you, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's gray, sorry. <laughs> That's why, no wonder you were confused. You were like, I'm not wearing blue. Um, so I just kind of wanted to say thank you for your coming out story. It meant the world to me. It's something I use myself to tell people how I feel about the world. Um, but as a perfectionist myself, I was wondering if either one of you ever look back on your novels and go, oh, I shouldn't have done that, or oh, I would have changed that scene. Ooh, do we ever have regrets? <laughs> like, do we ever... I am a time capsule, right? Actually, I want you to go first. Yeah, I, oh boy. This is my favorite thing about having a conversation partner. I'm like, you go. I mean, I, I, never, I never look back and say, oh, I wish I'd written this differently. And part of that is because when I was, when I was coming up, there were like... 
15 unpublished manuscripts before Beast Made of Night came out. And I'm like, I'm not a normal person. A normal person would have written one, gotten their rejections from their agents that they queried and everything like that, and then gone back and made it better, right? I was just like, oh, I'm going to write a better novel, which I did, but it was still it still got all the rejections and everything. And I just did that like 15 times, like a madman. <laughs> and so that's like the mentality that's been burned in my brain is not like, oh, go back and write the previous book better. It's always like, oh, let, just go write a better book. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm a time capsule believer, which is that like each book that we write is a time capsule of the person that we were when we were writing it. So like when The Near Witch which was my very first novel, was published in 2011, went out of print 18 months later. And it would come back in print five years after that, uh, after enough of you showed up. And they were like, okay, fine. Um, but like, I did not edit it. I did not believe in going back and revising that novel because I was 21 when I wrote that book. And it is a time capsule of who I was. Mm -hmm. To this day, there's only one thing that I didn't get to do in a book that I have like regrets about and it's in our dark duet which is the sequel to this savage song originally the tertiary storyline the storyline that's happening in prosperity um I got to like f do more with it and then because it was like classified as a YA novel they were worried about pacing and they convinced me to strip it mm. back and it's the only regret that I have because I felt really strongly about it and like I let the trends of publishing convinced me that it was something that I needed to fix. And that's the only one where to the point where when I went back into the paperback edition, I put the mm. scenes that they made me cut at the ending for anyone who wanted that extra context because it felt a little bit like a dropped note. Like I understood why the publisher wanted me to do it, but I also think they didn't understand that like, even though it was classified as YA, most of my readers like w would have the patient, like they, I think it was a disservice to the YA readership and to the adult readership because it felt like it, it wasn't trusting them. Yeah. That's the only one. But in general, no. I won't go back and revise a book even when it comes back in print because like, am I trying to change who I was? Mm. Like I wasn't, I wasn't at 21. I didn't know I was gay. I like couldn't figure anything out. Everything about my identity was subtext that I was like plotting through these books in terms of like otherness and outsider culture. Like I just didn't have articulation. I would be retconning my life to go mm. back and revise a novel that was written when I was that young. Yeah. No, we are who we are, whether it's 1764 yeah. or 2023. And also like, <laughs> I'm really glad I didn't, like I had a chance to write Addie at 25. And I didn't. Mm -hmm. And those extra five years between 25 and 30 changed what that book was. So I would hate to try and go back with the lens of 35 or of 40 or of 45. It would be a different book. This is a book in so many ways about the precariousness of turning 30 and being told you're an adult now. You should know what you're doing with your life. And like, I want that. I wanted the uncertainty that I felt at 30 where everyone was treating me like I suddenly had matured more overnight. <laughs> than I had the days before. Wow, I, now that is a button. Um, <laughs> everyone, let's give it up for the so Ishwa. Nice. <laughs> v Pochi, thank you guys so much. And thank you all so much for being here tonight. You've been a wonderful audience. Have a lovely evening. We have more signed copies back by the register. Thanks, guys.